Hey everyone, Kuro the Artist here, and welcome back to another Ben 10 Breakdown. Today we finish up the series finale of Ben 10 Ultimate Alien and the UAF era as a whole. And through all of its ups and downs, inconsistencies, and weird plot lines, there's one anchor point that I see that ties all of this together. Now usually when I talk about episodes, I try to stay very rooted into the then-current events at the time when the episodes was released, and what the writers must have been trying to do within the restrictions of the network. But I want to switch things up for this breakdown, and unapologetically talk about UAF in a very biased manner, how I see the series, and the message that I took away from my recent breakdown watch through. Now, do I think the writers plan to write the series this way? Hard to say. I'm not trying to argue the validity of that, and this is also not going to affect the ratings. But this is the way that I've been able to interpret everything, and what makes the series special to me. The story of Ben Tennyson through UAF is the story of Ben giving up control. In the classic series, we can see that Ben's heroics are definitely from his own ambition. We see this as he still willing to stick up for others before he even got the Omnitrix. And through the series, he has to learn what it's really like being a hero. Not just learning right from wrong, but learning to be humble, work with others, and adapting to unplannable scenarios. But with those lessons, he always learned them alongside a superior, Grandpa Max. Tetrax, Ultimos, Xylene, Azmuth, even his own future self. Practically every lesson he learns is through the guidance of a role model. He may be doing the right thing, but his journey is beyond his control. He's mostly reacting to the scenarios he finds himself in, and tries to do the right thing. In Alien Force, Ben is left on his own to figure things out. He has the support of his teammates, but when it comes to an authority figure, there isn't any. So he takes his previously learned lessons about humility, cooperation, and adaptiveness, and uses those skills to build a powerful network of heroes to defeat the hybrid and end a galactic war. Everything he's done, he did it his way. So of course, that'll put a chip on his shoulder. In Season 3, we see Ben fully embellish his passive control over the galaxy. While Ben's not directly in a ranked position of power, practically no one is strong enough to tell him what to do. And he knows this. If he wanted to, he can set foot anywhere and do whatever he feels like, because he's Ben Tennyson, the boy who stopped the hybrid war. He goes on to save Vilgax's home planet, uses his fame to bend the legal system, and even resurrects a whole species. When Ben is in control, he is put at such ease, it's hard for anything to feel like a challenge to him anymore. However, this attitude doesn't lead to flawless results, as his cockiness leads to consequences like breaking the Omnitrix, accelerating a planet's passion for war, and eventually bending to Vilgax's will. This shatters Ben's illusion of the control he thought he had on his surroundings, begging for Azmuth to help him, despite his arrogance. This is probably Ben at his lowest point at the time, and it's only when Ben feels completely helpless does he realize what he has to do. Destroy the Omnitrix. Now Ben understands that being in control isn't always about being better than your enemies. It's about taking away your enemy's power to control as well. In Ultimate Alien, Ben is now armed with the Ultimatrix and had his identity exposed. All that fame and glory he's been aspiring for is given to him in waves, to the point where there's times he no longer wants it, as if now that he has control, he's getting sick of it. But everything gets turned on his head when new enemies arrive, and for the first time, we see Ben constantly lose. Not just lose a battle, but get outsmarted time and time again, constantly shown that just when he gets comfortable, there's always going to be someone new that's out of his league. Everything between Greg, the Map of Infinity, and Ultimate Kevin became so far beyond his control that it breaks his moral code, prompting him to take the most extreme initiative in deciding to kill Kevin in order to put an end to this parade of failures. After everything he's been through, if there's one thing that he can do, he can ensure that it stops with Kevin's reign. Fortunately, Gwen was still able to get through to Ben at the last second, and it turns out that Gwen's way was the right solution. Beforehand, it was only when Ben had full control over the situation that led to victory, but here, it was giving up control that led to victory. This shows Ben that sometimes, the best thing you can do is get out of the way. This is further reflected in The Ultimate Sacrifice, where Saul claims that the only way for himself and the other Ultimates to survive is for Ben to take his own life and jump into a pit of fire. Ben chooses to sacrifice himself for them, the ultimate example of giving up control. Ben is then rewarded for his selflessness, as the Ultimatrix allowed him to live, proving that he made the right choice. So now that Ben understands he doesn't always have to be in control, how does he handle the 
Dagon War. At first, he trusts Azmuth's decision to fight George and take back Ascalon, believing that Azmuth knows best, once again continuing to give up control. But when confronting George, Ben is surprised to hear that George relates to Ben's desire to do things his way, even if the entire world tells you otherwise. How many times have you known in your heart that your way is best? How many times have your plans been thwarted because the very people you're trying to help won't trust you? So, is it better for Ben to have control, or to forfeit control? Because there's been success and failure in both situations, and this is where things get complicated. You see, even though Ben likes having full control, it's never in abundance. He always likes to fight fair. Humongo's too close to what I'll be fighting. I kinda let him win. I figured it was the only way you would lead me to the ranch. If this is going to work, I have to fight with honor. You know, you aren't wearing your battle suit, so I tried to make this a fair fight. Personally, I also believe that's why he usually waits to go ultimate it, because their power isn't always needed. But when Ben's pissed off, he will go straight to ultimate, embracing the authority his power gives him. He now gloats about his victories as a way to protect others, opposed to his own selfish egotism. Maybe you've forgotten something. I'm Ben Tennyson. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to release these prisoners. Now, we're at the finale where Ben has all of Dagon's power, which was used to conquer multiple universes. The power is trapped inside of Ascalon, the only weapon that can defeat said universe-conquering power. He has both sides of the war in the palm of his hands, not to mention he's still strapped with the ult matrix. Ben's current power level is so incomprehensibly high, it's almost like he is Alien X. Finally, Ben is in complete control of the entire universe, just like he wanted. There will never be someone out of his league again. And there, he is left with a choice. Should he use his incredible power to shape the world as he sees fit, or relinquish it and continue to fight the good fight on the ground with all the other mortals? The hard way, but the right way. I believe now it would be best to start the episode breakdown and continue this evaluation of Ben's character once we get to that scene in the episode. But for now, if this is your first breakdown and you're curious about how my rating system works, there's a detailed description down below along with a link to all my previous breakdowns. But by all means, watch this one first, I'm sure you'll still enjoy it. The final episode to receive a full writing credit by the late Dwayne McDuffie is The Ultimate Enemy Part 2, which first aired March 31st, 2012. With the Dagon released from the seal, George and the the trio stand as the last defense to save the entire universe. But with Vilgax looming over, he plans for a secret attack. Previously on Ben 10 Ultimate Alien. It's always really weird hearing Ben say the name of the show. You're not serving anybody but yourself. You know, now that I think about it, when did he have time to call Siphon? He pretty much went straight from grabbing the sword to going to the seal to being sucked in the seal, and then he comes out for this fight. There was no in-between time. So either Vilgax planned all of this in advance advance and knew he would be sucked into seal and knew he would become a herald to the Dagon, which is an incredible stretch. Or somehow he was able to contact Siphon while inside the seal, which is also a stretch, but I feel like less of a stretch than knowing he would get sucked in. I think they flipped this shot from the last episode too. All right, we're back to part one, and this is when Dagon's released. Yeah, this is that shot. So I guess they felt the need to flip it for the recap. I guess you could say it sets up the angle in which the Dagon is rising up at. At last. This at last was also placed somewhere else. In part one, he says it before he even leaves the seal. Right here. At last. And the shot they used is when he's laughing at the end. <laughs> But for the recap, I think it does fit better matching that shot with this line right here. At last. Last time I'm gonna be seeing this. This intro has grown on me, but it's the least exciting. Behold my might and tremble. He is very massive now, but also this entire area is empty. I guess all the other knights did get turned into Esoterica, and Dagon could have had them walk off to go prepare for whatever he's gonna do now, I guess. But it's crazy to see this place go from like hundreds of people fighting, huge epic battle, and now nobody is here but the main characters. <laughs> So I know he's shooting some type of like energy projectile, but we don't actually see it. We just see him make the slash and nothing shoots out. 
and then it appears on his head. Either they forgot to add the projectile slash effect, or this is just how the sword works. It's like some weird type of distance interactivity, like how when Doctor Strange reached into the sky and grabbed a star, and all of a sudden it was in his hand. So maybe George can just slash what he sees in front of him. No matter how far away something is, he could slash it. Insignificant spark. But I feel like there should be something a little more significant, since this is like the duel that's been set up all arc, and George and Dagon aren't really talking to each other. Like, Dagon's looking at the guy who put him away for like a thousand years. This should be a bigger deal to him. But he really has the nerve to say, Insignificant spark. Like, nah, dude, this is George. If anything, he's the one guy you wouldn't say that to. But I guess he just really doesn't care about him. Vilgax, where are you? He doesn't need Vilgax either. There is, like, genuine concern in his voice. Like, everything rides on having Vilgax as his herald. You're free now, dude. Let's see all that power you've been talking about. He has abandoned you! My resources aren't limited to Vilgax. I don't see why he still needs resources, period, though. Like, this is the Dagon. Legendary old one. Leader of the Lacubra army. Conqueror of universes. And now he's free and he still needs these esoterica i don't get it but remember how i've been talking about the difference between using the hard cut effect and the faded effect here they're using a mix of both see he's hard cut and these two are faded but the more this guy comes out he pops to being a hard cut and both dudes on the end are hard cuts the entire time i gotta say i know when the show wants to be they can have a very good attention to detail ultimate sacrifice is my new go-to example for that it's just peak uaf animation and effects and now we're on the series finale and so far, it's just, it's not looking great. Trio back here watching this doing nothing too. Maybe they still want to give George a chance to fight this out himself. Where'd I leave that new plumber rifle? Oh right, don't forget the merchandising. The Ben 10 Tech Blaster! Combine all five to build the ultimate Tech Blaster! <laughs> And that's it for Jury Rig. Ben becomes him last episode as if he's ready to fight. Jury Rig chills here for like a minute and then he's gone. I guess, yeah, it doesn't make sense for Ben to be Jury Rig, but like from a writing standpoint, it's kind of weird. I guess you can kind of hide in the confusion of switching episodes that Jury Rig didn't do anything. And I'm still under the assessment that he became Jury Rig because he saw Vilgax's machine and assumed he could handle it. But that wasn't acknowledged in the episode. So to us, all we're seeing is Ben use Jury Rig, walk out of a cave, and then turn back. But he's done that before too. Swamp Fire, Chroma stone nrg recently there's a handful of times ben becomes an alien and doesn't actually use it it just stands out for jury rig because he literally has two appearances in ua and one was an episode dedicated to him so we get a whole episode of ben learning to master this alien only for him to have a cameo in the finale and then not be used until omniverse protect george pump activated rifle what are you planning something big <laughs> So Kevin shoots these guys and they fade back into the Dagon world, also noting that they're not doing it at a parallel angle anymore either. But is this them trying to recover from being fired at? Or is Kevin literally shooting them through dimensions? <laughs> Oh boy, last time we're gonna be seeing this too. I love you, Dwayne. I really do. But going out on this episode, at least we have so much of his other work to appreciate. That's all I feel like I could say about that. It happened again. They go from having a feather to a hard cut. Maybe they start hard cutting when they're shadows, because like they need the interactivity with the floor. But even then, usually the shadow gets cut too. So I guess things are just working differently this time around. Why me? I just want to try something real quick. Throw some reverb on that. Why See, just a very simple effect, and he already sounds much larger than if you just do the dry vocals. Why me? See, now it seems so flat in comparison. But I do like that they're having the sky zoom out as he stands up. That does help emphasize his size. Why don't you pick on someone your own size? I'm gonna try one more time on that clip, too. Why don't you pick on someone your own size? There's definitely ways to, like, fine-tune that so it sounds more, like, professionally blended into the atmosphere. But yeah, just a little bit of reverb goes a long way. Why don't you pick on someone your own size? Why don't you pick on someone your own size? You are beneath my notice. Here we go. You know, I feel like this should be more hype. Maybe it is just me, though. Like, I think there's a fair amount of people that did enjoy this ultimate way big scene. But, like, because the ultimate feature was so underutilized, and I'm not gonna lie, ultimate way big's design isn't that great. I definitely prefer Ash's version, which you can check out in this ultimate overhauled series. It's a really cool concept. It ties in the cosmic storm elements from the video games. But there is one thing I'll give it credit for. Since way big was initially a big Tokusatu reference, this comment pointed out that ultimate way big's design continues that trend, where ultimate way big's horns 
shape is based on one of the other Ultraman forms. And I can see that. And you know, if it's paying homage to that, I respect it. But like, I'm not big into Ultraman, so I wouldn't have gotten that reference. So to me, this just looks like a very simplistic and kind of strangely colored way big. All 52 episodes and the Ultimates just never landed for me. Except for Ultimate Echo Echo. You're perfect. <laughs> I always did love this shot, though, of him just straight up flying upwards like he's Superman or something. You might as well go full-on superhero for this. How do y'all feel about Ultimate Way Big, though? Let me know down in the comments below. There's gotta be fans of him out there. It is underwhelming, though, that his one and only appearance, he's fighting someone so much bigger than him. So even though we have Way Big, who's Ben's largest form, and then his ultimate form, you see him grow. So he's much larger than Way Big. I really want to feel the size of this guy. But then you have him go up against this, and it's like, oh. I guess it does, like, play of how big Dagon is, though. Like, Dagon's friggin' ginormous. And I do like that they keep his eyes a solid glowing red, even though they do add a gradient to him. They keep the gradient off the eyes. Impossible. Dagon's impressed. Ooh, and he's stronger have to move Dagon. That is pretty cool. But now we're near this area, which I guess was just nearby this entire time. We've only really seen like that one shot of the cave, so I never really knew what was around that area. But that's got me thinking, is this the same Dan from X equals Ben plus two? Uh, it could be, I guess. There are roads in this area, and there was roads at the other dam, but that doesn't say much. And these buildings right here do kind of line up. Yeah, you know, it would be nice if it was the same dam. Also kind of makes me wish he used Alien X in this finale, though. If there was ever a time for him, this would be it. Yeah, you know what? I swear to God, this is the same damn. But yeah, the first thing we see Dagon do is get freaking toppled down by Ultimate Waybig after pleading for Vilgax and his Esoterica to come save him. He's really not sticking the landing on all that hype he's had the past, like, 15 episodes or so. Good water, though. I like that his laser keeps firing as he runs. Like, once he starts shooting it, it's automatically going until he turns it off. That's gonna be expensive. That's pretty cool. I wonder if this is Ben's first time being Ultimate Way Big, because he seems pretty well versed in his moveset. And granted, he's done that many times with brand new aliens. But I'd believe it if Ben, like, secretly gave this guy a shot one time off screen just to see what he does. I wish they put at least a little bit of detail inside of his tentacle being chopped off. Like what they did with the Lacubra. But of course it grows back. Look at the little ridges on his tentacle when he shoots it out. That's nice. Turbo! Let's go. Gwen's gotta use her most repeated spell in the finale. I genuinely do like that. And she always uses it different every time. They can't teleport through your shield. They move between dimensions. I swear, they establish that every single time they fight these guys. Gotta keep the new viewers educated. How do we use it to help Ben? By helping George. Where is George? Yeah, George isn't even on screen right now. This is supposed to be his legendary battle, and now he's basically irrelevant. Are you simply too unintelligent to realize how hopeless your struggle? Yeah, but Dagon, he's actually pulling some good moves on you. And it looks like Dagon shrunk down to his size, too, to fight him easier. I like his big three tentacles for him. It's more unique than just the floating head. Ooh, look at that flash frame. ka -chow. Cool move, though. Acid rain. Strange it doesn't also affect the ground. Here these look like CG clusters though, not just an image. They actually look really good. Every still frame seems like it could just be a painting. If you notice, when Dagon disappears, Ultimate Waybig's laser starts extending further. That's a great detail. But you do see, and I think this is an error, but it works because it looks like there's a gap in the water. The two different layers of Dagon separate when he fades away. Because if you notice, only the top parts of him are moving, and the bottom parts are perfectly still. Because that's two different layers, but when they both turn transparent, you can see through the top layer, and it reveals the bottom. If your character is built based on multiple layers, which in all honesty, every single thing is, when you start making them all individually transparent, it reveals the layers underneath. Even if you make everything equally transparent, you're making them all see through to each other. So see how Larry is in front of Bob right here? And we're gonna make both of them transparent. Parent, but now you see Bob more clearly under Larry. What you need to do is once your character is fully put together, merge them all into one solid video, then you can make them all collectively transparent. So if we do it this time, now you never see Bob through Larry. That was a very lengthy way just to say I can see that happening right here, the layer separation. Hey, we're in the UA finale breakdowns. I'm gonna let myself get pretty intricate. It's only on top of him though, just walk forward, bro. That's weird. Is the lightning coming from way big as a sign of him getting hurt? I guess so. 
Thank goodness Dagon was kind enough to stop the rain once Ben transformed back to human. There we go. My god, George has those stretched hamstrings. Taste my sword! It's not a season finale if Ben doesn't pass out. Okay. Now we're pulling out the stops. So Ultimate Wild Mud is the last ultimate in the whole series. I guess they're just trying to get all their underutilized transformations out there. That was cool. She's still resisting Dagon's power for a little bit though. Even if it doesn't hold, that's incredible. Look at Kevin bulk up too. I don't think we've ever seen him do this. Coincidental metal piece on the ground. They couldn't even make it one of the knight's helmets or something. You can also see Kevin's skin layer underneath this one. A lot of layer analysis for this breakdown. And that's it for Ultimate Wild Mutt 2. That was like barely anything. We're almost halfway done this episode and like can't help but feel they're wasting the finale. The Ultimate Way Big Fight was kind of cool, I guess, but like why are we still wasting time fighting these no names when the bad guy, the arc villain is here and we're spending so much time away from him, especially George versus Dagon? You're worried about Vilgax. I hate to look past the giant demon raining down fire from the sky. I hate to look past it too. Can we get back to that? Which we can deal with after- Look at this, the legendary battle has been reduced to happening off screen as we talk about Vilgax again. Remember when Asmuth took the trio back in time to the first time George fought the Dagon and it was like this horrifying chaotic battle and they only showed it off screen? It's like that's happening again. I'm just gonna pretend that that's what's happening here and they're doing it on purpose. Is it ready? So this is Vilgax's power drainer, which we saw in Vengeance of Vilgax part one and two in Alien Force. I guess it's kind of neat to see this come back. Also, you'd think that Dagon would be able to sense Vilgax somehow, because he is infused with all that Lacubra energy, and I mean if Gwen can sense other beings, Dagon should be able to. Their power sets versus their size makes it pretty hard to choreograph a battle like this too. George has some ranged attacks, but not primarily, and he also can't fly. And due to Dagon's size and being in the sky, there's not a lot of room for interactivity. They should have had Dagon shrink down and form to like a human-sized combatant just to make this battle work a little bit more. Like it'd be obvious like that's what they're doing. But you can come up with a billion in-universe reasons for him to do that. Maybe he's like, I don't need to use my full power to beat you. Or maybe he turns into a clone of George to mock him and he fights like negative George. Not great examples, I know, but like, I would trade him shrinking down for a poor reason than limiting yourself to the interactivity between George and him. Maybe he can even turn back into the dragon to like honor their past battle. That'll at least like lead to something with more versatility in what you can do with it. Of course he's tired. I did love this scene though, Chromastone taking a blast from Dagon. After seeing Chromastone take a bunch of L's lately, it's nice for him to do something really cool. I gotta say, I like this effect they have for him, but I'm so used to the other, where it's like the crystallized mosaic-y aura around him. He does do it right here though, like this kind of texture. This is like a whole animated texture that's layered on top of him. But his blast does look awesome. Culminates in a giant sphere and a powerful beam erupting out of his chest. This is the kind of action I should be seeing, and it even hurts Dagon so hard he shudders. Already doing much better than Ultimate Waybig. But it's also worth noting that he's shooting Dagon's own power right back at him, so that's probably why it does more damage. Now would be a good time to use it! There we go. Yeah, take him down. How much power can you absorb? A lot! I like to think that Ben has no idea and he's just guessing. How much stronger do I get when I'm older? A lot! How long can you hold that up there? I don't know. A while. How much power can you absorb? A lot! Magnus Fox! <laughs> Ooh, a spell shooting mana. Sounds like a, it's a multiplying spell. So she's not just shooting mana for him to absorb, she's shooting a very specific kind. And it hypercharges him. Dagon's adapting though. First he's actually taken the hits, but now he's gotten used to it. And they can't affect him anymore. Boom, smacked on the ground. That's the Chroma Stone we all know and love. See, another problem with having him up in the sky is there's not too much of a variety of ways you can do this shot. Like, they're very limited to the way they can set up their camera, too. You're either looking up or you're looking down. Clouds cannot protect you from my wrath. Ooh, you actually see a skeleton and everything. This is done very nicely, too. I love all the effects on this. Oh, he's back to his regular form. And there he goes. 
Dagon killed him. Oh man. This specific scene right here is pretty dramatic, but because of the weird pacing of the episode so far, they didn't really build up to this in a way to emotionally connect with it. This is one death I do think should have been done with a little bit more of the audience's emotions in mind, as opposed to my other argument where Edwards and Winston died, and I was like, it's cool if you don't feel anything, but this one I feel like you should have felt something. Maybe if you like centered the battle around him fighting Dagon instead of like Esoterica and Ultimate Way Big and Ultimate Wild Mud and all this junk that like no one really cares about. Like they sound like neat bullet points. Like if you're pitching out a story and be like, all right, he goes Ultimate Way Big, then Kevin can use that plumber rifle and fight more Esoterica. Sure, it sounds great, but like everything in the season didn't build up to this. We were building up to George versus Dagon, and that fight literally happened in the background for like most of his scenes, and then George gets killed in a visually nice way, but emotionally insufficient. George didn't make it. Then it's up to us. We're right here with you, Ben. I think their reactions were a good way to handle it, though. Like, you can tell they care, but they also need to prioritize the mission. It's like what that plumber said to Ben. Sorry about your team. It comes with the territory, Ben. We're all professionals here. But I mean, still, so much build up for George just for him to go out like this. It didn't even feel that legendary of a death either. It's kind of just what happened. But he does die on screen though, so going back to another point in the previous breakdown, where Derek said they had to edit out a death for the finale because Cartoon Network didn't want anyone dying, but George does die on screen and we see it. I don't know what to assume about that anymore. You presume yourself even capable of betraying me? Wow, Dagon doesn't even care that Vilgax betrayed him. That's pretty bold. Did you truly think I would allow you to conquer my universe? You know what that line made me realize? Vilgax technically saves the day for a little bit at least. Vilgax like, I'll save the universe as long as I get to rule it. It's kind of what I'm doing with Divinity, actually, in 5YL, but I guess Vilgax beat me to it. I'm going to destroy your presence. Dagon, just kill him. See, Dagon should be able to just destroy this machine. I know it absorbs energy, but like, it's hard to believe it has infinite capability to do so. Because Dagon's on like a whole other level. If you take a plastic cup and you fill it with water, sure. But if you fill that plastic cup with like lava, it shouldn't still hold. It would destroy the cup, even though the cup's purpose is to hold liquid. So even though this is an energy draining machine against Dagon and it still works, ah, uh, I mean, it wouldn't be that big of a deal if they didn't spend the whole season hyping up Dagon and how great and powerful he is. This machine simply absorbs power. But my substance is power. Does that mean Dagon's an energy being? <laughs> Goodbye, Dagon. And now the two most important key players in this arc, who had a lot of dedicated backstory, a lot of hype surrounding their final battle, and pretty much are the reason this whole thing is happening, are both taken out pretty quickly, and now it's over. That's it. That whole story is wrapped up. Now it's about Vilgax once more. At this point, it just feels disrespectful for the writers to do this to themselves. Like, what was the point of all of this if Vilgax is just gonna swoop in and say, hey, you know all those episodes we dedicated to the Dagon and George? None of that matters now. Dagon gets defeated like that, through a plan that had no foreshadowing, in a method that to me contradicts Dagon's immense power, and it didn't even feel that clever. Honestly, I think it would have been cooler if Vilgax tried to betray Dagon, and it didn't work, and then Dagon kills Vilgax right there. Not only would that play up Dagon's threat even more, but seeing Vilgax, who's been the big bad since season one of the original show, finally get ultimately defeated, I think that would have been a great way to put an end to Vilgax, and also force Dagon to be the final boss, and keep George around for him a little bit more. Maybe George can die a little bit later in the episode. He can still die, just not so inadequately. In fact, they could have even saved Ultimate Way Big for later after Dagon kills Vilgax and then make Ultimate Way Big powerful enough to defeat Dagon because he's an artificially constructed being from the Ultimatrix, something nobody could have planned for, especially Dagon. So Dagon can be so impressed by the immense power of the Ultimatrix and then that actually makes going ultimate more important and that makes Ben the ultimate alien. Siphon, don't! I don't get why they're trying to convince Siphon. He's gonna do it. Ben should go fast track and just smack Siphon away from the controls right now. They're just letting this happen. See, this is where the esoterica could come in handy. If they're keeping them distracted or holding them down or something. Now that it's actually necessary for the story to utilize the mooks, they're nowhere to be seen. The esoterica worships me because I look like Dagon. His mouth doesn't move when he first starts coming out. You can see it when he says like Dagon. Look like Dagon. Now I am the Dagon. I just feel really misled with this whole arc. I like all of the setup, and I like the very last couple of moments, but the actual finale episodes, like everything from the beginning of the end till like Mount Rushmore, which we'll get to soon, is the least interesting part to me. I like all the lore, and I like the character development for Ben. That's about it. You won't thwart me ever again. Go Alien X. For real though, like Ben was gonna go Alien X against Greg. 
that's a pretty cool effect. I'll give him that. You can even see clouds of smoke bursting from it, but it's sort of disguised by this blur effect. But there's enough motion there to make this look intense. There's photorealistic Mount Rushmore. So we haven't seen this since War of the Worlds, when the gang was gathering up other heroes while Ben talked to Azmuth. It looked so much better there, though. I think they had to remake the background for the third time. First time being, of course, in the negative 10 when we first found this area. So we've seen three different versions of this background now, one from each version of the show. Omniverse had this room too, but they didn't do the famous downward angle for it. Could have had a full set. This is the old plumber base in South Dakota. This is interesting to Ben, because he didn't tag along the last time they were here. But Gwen and Kevin were just here, like, less than a year ago. That's gotta be a record. Is it? Gwen already teleported them from the UK back to America, which is... If you lowball it, that's about 4,200 miles. And the max distance across America is only 2,800 miles. So even at both extremes, there's no way that traveling from wherever the seal is to here is a bigger distance than Dagon's fortress to the seal in the night to remember. So I'm just gonna assume Ben's just wrong here. That's not really an error. You got gotta be wasted. Drink some juice or something. Kevin's a good hangover, buddy. How long do you think we have? Maybe a few days. Tennyson! Ben's instantly wrong. Destroy them, my esoterica. Yeah, again, he doesn't really sound gigantic. I'm gonna try slapping some reverb on that. Destroy them, my esoterica. I'm sure an actual audio engineer could probably even have a better effect to use. Here they come. I like that one of them's traditional to make the CG ones look less obvious, but this guy's like right here, so he gives it away pretty quick. Look how far back this goes too. There, You can even see some back here. But none are phasing through dimensions. They're climbing walls and stuff. I'm assuming it's because it's Vilgax in control, not Dagon, and he doesn't properly know how to command the Esoterica. Also, just notice the top of Gwen's head is like floating above the chair right here. If boys ever bothered to read the manual. Man, I'm all about reading the manual. I save every single manual of everything I buy in a nice little stack in my closet. Instructions for this base's self-defense system. Of course, it shoots out of the eyes. You will not escape me again! Honestly, I don't know what they could do visually different for Dagon becoming Vilgax, but since we've already seen his Vilkubra form, and this is essentially just that as a head, and with red eyes instead of purple, it's just not that cool. I don't know, how would you guys design Dagon Gax to look different from Vilkubra? You don't actually have to draw anything, you can throw a comment, but I mean, feel free to draw something and tag me in it, I'd love to see. I might even give it a shot myself, but right now I'm blanking on ideas, so it feels like disingenuous to hate on it, but I gotta be honest, like, I feel like there's a more creative design for this. This is cool though. In fact, this is essentially what I wanted Dagon himself to do. And it's animated pretty nicely as well, so that helps. It's weird that it goes out of focus though. And it also seems as if he's shedding his mask, because he's not just shrinking down. He like morphed into the oozing funnel and then it blorps off of him. And now he's got that Saiyan aura. <laughs> I like this shot of him too, though, going straight through the laser. He shouldn't be struggling right here, though. He should be able to tear that face off like nothing. Is this really what the other side of Mount Rushmore looks like, though? I thought there was, like, buildings and walkways and stuff. I've looked this up before, but I gotta do it again. Yeah, see how it's all touristy and whatnot? Is this it right here? Is this Mount Rushmore? Oh, no, this is Mount Rushmore. Okay, here's all the faces and stuff. All right, yeah, so it is just like trees and stuff, but I mean, you do see roads and buildings. There's not really any mountains over here. So this should have been like even more trees if they just needed like some filler stuff to throw in the background. That's gonna be kind of hard to cover up. Well, they've done it before. Instantly taken out. Ugh. I mean, even then, I'd be fine if they got instantly taken out in, like, a more satisfying way. He's got all of this godlike power right now. They've taken so many rocks and explosions to the face, like, episode after episode. You can't sit here and tell me that this is what does them in. And here we are again. Me, on the cusp of total victory. You, the last man standing. That line, I'll, it's poetic in a way. I like it. Because they have fought so many times, and this is the scenario they always find themselves in. Who will it be? Diamond Head? Swamp Fire? Always weird to hear Vilgax actually say their alien names, but I wonder if he's saying those specifically, because that is what he used last time to defeat him. Diamond Head's what took him down in Vengeance of Vilgax, and Swamp Fire, and I guess Ultimate Swamp Fire, is what defeated him in the ocean. So Vilgax is paying attention. What are your tiresome ultimate aliens? Man, I wish they were used enough to be tiresome. Now that this episode has created this scenario. Yeah, I do think it's more satisfying for Ben to use the sword than Alien X, but like, there's so many different directions you could have taken this finale. It doesn't even really feel like we got here naturally. Like, can you believe this whole story used to be about George and the Dagon? No transformations. Not this time. And Ben never transforms again. Chromastone is the last UAF transformation, and it wasn't even grandiose. 
Maybe I'm just being super nitpicky. But even this, like, why is he even bothering to pick this up and throw it? Dagon made it rain acid. He created a storm and formed a lightning bolt that killed an immortal being. And aren't the Esoterica done climbing that mountain by now? What happened to them? There's six billion of them. Where are they? <laughs> On a note of positivity, though, I do like that even though these wires and stuff are part of the background texture, they do move and stuff as he's disconnecting everything. <laughs> This is a good sword. It is. Even if it was that sharp, it must be enhancing Ben's strength too to cut through this. Or it's just that infinite tennis and strength again. Take your pick. This is pretty awesome. Forms in green flames and lightning shooting around him. Everyone who put this on did it differently. Vilgax, I think it was just a flash or something like that. Probably just for maximum drama. And in George, you saw it built around him, but there was no aura. And here, it's not really building around him. It's just kind of like morphing over him. But I love the green aura and the lightning. It makes it look pretty epic. And I guess this is a, a neat effect too. I kind of did wish it like built over him a little bit more though. They even kind of did that with George, but I still like the look of this. As my old friend George used to say, how about all right, that's good. I'll give him that. It's a great opportunity for that line. You know what? George and Ben should have been closer together too. It's it's very difficult to like not fault the episode for missed opportunities because then it's just like, oh, well, I would have done this. But I mean, there's not much left to offer here with this story. Anything. Think of the worst arc in Ben 10 so far of all three series we've broken down. And I bet there's still some pretty solid character threads and moments of development throughout the story. And I don't feel that with the Dagon arc. That's what's missing. It's got great lore. It's got cool new powers. There's a solid story there with the Forever Knights and Esoterica, but it does nothing to make you care about any of that, and all of that gets tossed aside for Ben versus Vilgax. That is why I believe this arc fails. But at least Vilgax is trying to use his power more. That was pretty awesome, though. That was probably the only cool part of this fight. Vilgax forms this giant purple energy blast, and Ben smashes it back, blasting right into Vilgax. More stuff like that, please. <laughs> Vilgax's teeth are very different right here than they normally are. Here they're just regular spiky teeth and not the weird Vilcubra fangs. You don't even see the impact either, it's just a bright flash. Such a weird sound effect too for Vilgax falling. That right there, it sounds like a stock sound effect you'd use in a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. And all of a sudden he's back in his warlord garb. We've seen this outfit get ripped apart in the ocean. I mean, I guess Dagon's power could bring it back, sure, and Vilgax didn't want to be naked. You stabbed me! Yeah, man, that's what happens when you don't block. Also, I know that you stabbed me thing became like a meme in the Ben 10 community, and I, I think I was responsible for that. I might have been. And the reason why I found it humorous is because he's so surprised. You stabbed me like it's not even the delivery or anything or the fact that the battle ended with a stab it's like why is vilgax so shocked he's like i can't believe you've done this you've only tried to murder me nearly every single time we fought but if you stab me gosh ben have some dignity. Don't be such a baby. Ben says that so aggressively, too. Don't be such a baby. That delivery is a little humorous for me. I just took Dagon's power from you. And dressed him up again. Maybe Vilgax got his outfit back because since Ben can, like, manipulate space-time now with the sword, he can't picture what Vilgax looks like without his warlord garb anymore, so when he stabbed him and took all of Dagon's power, Ben, without knowing, like, subconsciously put Vilgax back in this form again. You have the Ultimatrix, the Sword of Azmuth, and the power of Dagon at your fingers. Tips. All incredible power. That's a very weighted sentence. The Omnitrix used to be described as the key to ending a galactic power struggle, and the Ultimatrix, in some ways, is an improvement over that. Not to mention the power of a god that conquered other universes and a reality-altering sword. Ben Tennyson is the most powerful he's ever been right now. What will you do with all this power? Turn everybody on Earth back to human, for starters. See, that's something I feel gets overlooked, is what Ben ends up doing and the final choice he makes was the first thing that came to mind with him originally. So had Vilgax not tempted him and given him a whole psychological evaluation, Ben was already going to cure everybody because it's just purely in his nature. He's not trying to interfere with the flow of life. He's just trying to save everybody and protect those who can't protect themselves. You say you want peace and justice? Use your power! But Vilgax also does get in Ben's head. And maybe you can chalk this up to the small plot point they said where like the Sword of Ascalon corrupts you or whatever, even though that was only mentioned in one episode and it didn't end up corrupting 
King George. So the one person who could have been proof of that, it didn't work on. So I really do think this is all about Ben. And he's actually starting to feed into Vilgax's words. You could wipe out all evil. I really could. And that's what he could do with Alien X anyways. I know all of those things don't compare or even touch the power of Alien X, but on a universal scale, the power Ben has currently and the power Alien X has is pretty much the same. It's just Alien X could do even more than that, but I mean, it's so superfluous, it's unnecessary. Ben is a god right now. He can do anything. I really could. And now he's actually considering it too. Ben, what are you saying? He can create whatever universe he imagines. I do wonder what the motivation for Vilgax corrupting Ben like this is. He did play the Dagon, so maybe he's just trying that card again, where if he can get through to Ben and corrupt him, perhaps he can manipulate Ben to do his bidding, like being the right-hand man to a king. Or Vilgax is like, if I'm gonna lose, I might as well try to mess with Ben. But either way, yeah, it's, it's curious to see Vilgax try to tempt Ben like this. Just wipe out evil. Do it! And you can tell Ben's really considering it too. In fact, this is probably the first time that he's actually acknowledged the immense power he has. And that's also probably why he doesn't use Alien X. Like, he logically knows how powerful it is, but emotionally, once you really think about having that capability, it's a totally different perspective. And that's why his initial decision is to just turn everybody back, because Ben knows, like, logically, that's the right thing to do. He doesn't really think about things on a personal level when it comes to the battle. He's just trying to solve problems and be a hero, but now he's placing himself in the scenario and thinking about him. I swear, it always looks like Julie's coming down from the moon. I thought we agreed to make all of our big decisions together. You know we all love you, Ben. It's also crazy that she was able to hear him, but, you know, ships enhance hearing and whatever. It's just, you know, mechamorph magic. Also, to note from my last breakdown, a lot of people said Ship was able to protect Julie because he was metallic, and I buy that explanation, I do. In fact, I'm actually a little disappointed I didn't think of it myself. But if you try to do this, you're the same as Vilgax, or any of the others. Not the best delivery for this either. It's like they only had Vivin for like five minutes and we're just like, just read this real quick. She doesn't actually sound concerned that the entire universe might change. You try and stop me? We would stop you. Y'all couldn't even stop a concrete wall a couple minutes ago. You're not afraid of me? <laughs> lovely morph animation too. It's quick but efficient. And I love the tense state that Ben is in right now. You're not afraid of me? You can tell he's almost disappointed they're not afraid. Like now he's actually starting to recognize the true power he has. He's really thinking about it instead of just putting it in the way in the back of his mind. And I think he low-key wants to be a threat. There's definitely this side of Ben that could lead to him being corrupt and evil. And I feel like Ben just has to ignore that version of himself. We got to see him play around with it a little bit in Above and beyond, and there has been moments in UA where he starts to let his aggression take over. There's this locked up darkness inside of Ben that he knows he can never acknowledge. It's exactly like what he says in the Forge of Creation. Maybe that's too much to have in your head when you have to win. If I pretend everything's a big joke, I'll be able to do what I have to do. But then you ask his teen self and he says, Is that why you're so arrogant all the time? No, I'm actually oblivious. You can tell he's just saying that. It's easier for him to pretend to be oblivious than for him to actually meditate on these thoughts and consider, you know what? I am a god. I could just practice and train to use Alien X. I I could just ruthlessly kill anybody if I wanted to. And it's dangerous to think like that because it's a lot easier to ignore these thoughts than to think about them but still choose not to do it. It's like forcing ignorance. I can help everybody at once. And he's trying to justify his power because it's for the benefit of other people. And like, when you phrase it like that, it sounds like a solid argument, right? But look at the kind of person it's turning Ben into. Because once you start that, once you start thinking like that and acting upon it, how far do you go? Where does it stop? In fact, what Julie says right here, Look, there's a line. I'm not sure where it is, but I'm sure this is way on the wrong side of it. And she's right. There's like, there's these seeds of becoming corrupt by power. It could happen to anybody, even the best of us. Do it. Be quiet. And I think that's the last time Vilgax ever talks. That be quiet was super effective. You're tempted. Like, I was tempted to go full anodyne. And like when I lost control of my powers. Those are excellent notes to mention. Ash and I were talking about how Gwen and Kevin have this potential to relate to each other with their own mutual struggle of not allowing themselves to be as powerful as they can because of the repercussions it has. Gwen can't be full anodyne, and Kevin can't recklessly absorb energy, and now Ben is in their shoes. So they even know firsthand what Ben's going through, and they're like, you gotta, you gotta back off, dude. But like I said, Ben's never thought about it, so he has to go through this. He has to make these decisions.
decisions and evolve. He can't keep ignoring who he is. After everything we've been through, is this the way you want it all to end? Oof, that actually gave me chills. See, this whole scene, this is what the story should have been about. I just feel like you could have done this with Dagon and George instead of Vilgax. Similar beats could have led to this event, but I mean, we're here and I love it. This, this is what makes me like the finale. Everybody stop talking, let me think! And the wonderful flashback sequence. Now this is a very iconic scene, I realize that, and I don't want to hate on it too hard, but I will say that even back when I first ever saw this on its premiere, I was very perplexed by their scene choices here. Like some of them are pretty solid memories, but like certain things are weird to be important to him, like why is his almost kiss with Eunice here, or Addy being electrocuted by Greg, or the rust bucket crashing in the perplexahedron, and half of the stuff he wasn't even here for, like Max being brought to the hybrid, Gwen and Kevin dancing, Galapagos fighting Greg, that's like super removed from him, Gwen tracking down Darkstar? What are these clips? There are some solid ones in here though. Meeting the plumber's helpers, going alien X, fighting Albedo. But even then, there's no like theme to these. I feel like the theme of this sequence of flashbacks should have been all the people Ben met along the way and thinking about every time he met somebody and it changed who he was. Like this is a really good scene to be thinking about when Cash and JT stood up for Ben at school when he first became famous. That I feel like is a valid thing to consider when altering the universe. How even those who used to torment him in his childhood still ended up sticking up for him once they realize the impact he had on the world and all the good he's done. Or Gwen and Charmcaster, even though it's not about him, Ben was there and he can recognize how, at least in this moment, one of their greatest enemies was able to work with them for the betterment of the universe. Or Ben meeting his young self to reflect on who he was then and how he's grown now. And being with Julie on the alien planet shows how far their relationship has evolved into. Quite literally too, I mean they're super far away from Earth. Ending on this shot was very smart though, I like that. I know there's a lot of flashback edits out there on YouTube YouTube already. I kind of want to make my own. If I do, I will link it down below. But I mean, the scene itself with Ben reflecting on everything through UAF, the idea of it is great. I like that. And I also think just for the respect of UAF, the flashbacks should only be from UAF. So if I do my own, I'm not going to show any classic series ones because this is about, in a meta way, the journey the writers took Ben through and everything that led up to here. I think this is more of a tribute to the legacy of UAF and that's how I would treat it as well. And they get ready. They don't know what he's gonna do. Vilgax is curious too. And I love this shot. Another iconic shot of the show. I love the music too. Why does such a great scene have to take place in such a mixed and confusing episode? Also, this is the most realistic the Earth has ever looked in the show. I wouldn't be surprised if this is an actual photo. What did you do? Turn every esoteric on Earth back to human with all the free will that goes along with that. So still, ultimately, he decided to give up his control of the universe. He even takes off the sword. He doesn't even transform them back and be like, there's other things I could do without ruling the universe. Like, he doesn't want to touch this power at all. And now we're seeing Ben and not ignore his capabilities or his responsibilities. He put everything into perspective and truly thought about what kind of hero he wants to be. And he still chose the most noble decision. I know I've given Ben a lot of flack over the years and it's so tiresome to say, but with the inconsistent writing, of course, it's hard not to. But I hope that this video gives you a better understanding of his character as a whole and through my eyes allows you to appreciate the kind of person he is. And the first time they've kissed, took him over a hundred episodes, but we finally finally got a Ben Lee kiss. Also, Vilgax isn't shown anymore at all. It's like he's gone. I, I like to think that during this giant DNA wave, Ben teleported him to jail or something, or like sent him back into space. Also, I'm noticing a lack of flaming green aura. What to do with this? Return it to its creator. There it goes. Azimuth is always on some wizard shit, but for one frame, you can see the sword created a hole in Ben's arm as it's teleporting away. You were right. That's too much power for any... What? Oh, I wish they let him finish that line. I get that he's shocked and they're trying to push the story to go into the new Omnitrix reveal, but let him have this moment of revelation. The Ultimatrix! Give it to me! And Ben does that without hesitation either. I feel like that's a very notable thing too. Ben doesn't ask why or try to resist. He literally threatened to kick Azimuth's ass multiple times when he tried to take the Omnitrix, but here he's so embellished in his humble perspective. He's willing to just give it up without question. Now we're seeing the birth of a new Ben and this sets up a version of the character that I gotta admit we don't get a payoff for an omniverse. In omniverse it's like time to reset him all over again. When considering scenes like this, if this was the end of Ben 10, if this was the true finale of the Prime franchise, I think this is a very respectable way for Ben to go out. I don't get why it cracks and falls off though. 
Like this whole thing is just pretty weird. Maybe Azmuth like unhooked it when he wasn't looking or something or used his freaking remote. It's also the last time we see the Ultimatrix too. I thought I'd proved I was worthy. You have proved your worth. And the theme of worthiness comes back around once more. It's always been a debate about whether or not Ben's truly worthy of his power. And now we've gone so far where Azmuth will say, This inferior copy of my Omnitrix isn't worthy of you. Ben's now become more worthy than his own power. I don't- Oh, for the love of- Look at your wrist! Azmuth's frustration does sully the moment a little bit. This is one I wish they did play straightforward. I mean, it's very in character for Azmuth, but we're cutting all of the emotional beats a bit short, and I just- I want to resonate with this. And now the first time we see the Omniverse Omnitrix. But if you actually compare it to the Omniverse one, there are some notable differences. For one, in the Omniverse one, the corners have the green lines extended and force the triangle shape with the white. Here, they just kind of stop right at the strap. Also, the black lines are much thicker, and this is more round. Also, UAF Ben is the only Ben to have worn all four series Omnitrixes. An Omnitrix? You can even see the Omnitrix in his eyes in a moving shot too. I gotta admire that. The Omnitrix I've been working on ever since you were given the prototype. Now that might sound a little bit like a retcon, the fact that the original Omnitrix was a prototype. But thanks to our head wiki mod, shoutouts to Levi, he's found evidence that as far back as 2006 on the Cartoon Network website, they do call the Omnitrix a prototype. Now I've already been down the outside of the show info spiel a billion times, so whether or not it was canon back then is obviously questionable. But the fact that this information exists as early as that it does feel like there was something there, like the idea was there. Maybe it wasn't planned to be paid off, maybe it was an early idea that they scrapped but they're bringing back. I don't know how how intricate the idea that the original Omnitrix was a prototype this entire time was, but this, you can't ignore this. This is something. I also found it being called a prototype in another comic too, but this was around UA so they could have had the idea already. But even if Ben was never meant to get an official Omnitrix, as we saw with the original Ben 10,000, he kind of just has the same one and it evolved. I do believe that it's possible that the original Omnitrix was always meant to be a prototype. I just think that it was not always planned for there to be a follow-up. I don't know how to thank you. Keep doing the right thing. Man, even Ben and Asmuth's relationship has come a long way. Character-wise, this is a near-perfect ending to the series. Kevin has evolved, Gwen has evolved, Ben has evolved, and now they're the perfect trio. We even get a little bit of that in Omniverse. You see how well and functional they are as a team. It's effortless, and I'm I'm truly going to miss the, the core trio. I don't suppose you'd consider giving me the master control. Always gotta take a chance, Ben. It is pretty trippy to see UAF Ben wear the OV Omnitrix, though. Perhaps for your 18th birthday. I like to think Asmuth was serious about that, like he really is going to just be like, happy birthday Ben, here's master control. I'd be fine with that. And it's over. This is a wonderful addition. I know I was ragging on this finale, but I mean, the legacy that Dwayne left in Ben 10, it was such an honor to have this ride through the words of Dwayne McDuffie. This whole ending scene, I feel like this is, this is the McDuffie writing I've been waiting for. All this other junk with like Ultimate Way Big and more esoterica and Dagon being a schmuck, I could do without. In fact, by the time I get to this scene, I forgot like all of this even happened. It's so irrelevant. Okay, that was it. Final episode of UA. It ended on a very, conflicting note. And it's sad to say, I'm I'm only going to give the plot a two. I feel like explaining myself at this point would just be redundant for the amount of critique I've been giving throughout this breakdown. It's misguided, it's aimless, they really, really did George and the Dagon done so dirty. But wrapping up Ben's very shaky character art in a way that I think satisfies and improves on Ben, despite it being the last scene of UA, I think it's wonderful. Characterization will get a three for all the same reasons. Visuals is a three. It's passable. There's some really cool stuff in there. I'm just pretty picky when I'm analyzing, but I mean, it's it's all right. I really wish the entire world turning into esoterica felt like it like more was happening, and like pretty much the whole army got wiped out by George Washington's eye lasers. That was kind of lame. But seeing Ben in the armor looked cool. Julie came in at the last minute to add her own perspective. But I mean, ultimate way big. What was that? Importance five. Entertaining three. It's just it's so it's super hit or miss. Half of y'all are gonna say I rated this too high. Half of you are gonna say it was so much better and I should have rated it higher. It's enough, I guess. This is, it's an ending. It functions. It works. Is it a great ending? 
Not really, at least not until the end of the episode. But that leaves Ultimate Alien off at a 16 out of 25. Honestly, looking forward to Omniverse really saves this ending. It doesn't have to end here. What did Alien Force get? Alien Force ended on an 18 out of 25 with the final battle part two. And depending on which ending you want to take, Classic either ends on a 16 or a 14. So I guess like, you know, it, it fits within the track record for Ben 10 finales. It's always like the middle parts of Ben 10, you know? Classic's best stories were like between seasons two and three, back with a vengeance, Ben 10,000. But then negative 10s parts one and two, eh. Alien Force, season two ending was peak. But in the end, final battle, eh. Ultimate Alien, Map of Infinity and Ultimate Kevin, great stuff. But again, not a not a great ending. I guess that's just Ben 10 for you. Longtime breakdown viewers also know that this is usually where I would put the chart segment and I'm sorry to disappoint, but I'm going to skip out on those for now for two reasons. For one, I am planning to do another Break the Breakdowns event in the future. The first one did pretty well. I was able to clarify a lot of things and get some stuff off my chest. And I'm pretty sure I'll do another one by the end of Omni. Universe. So there's a chance that even if I sit here and make these charts, they're just gonna change anyways. That's also why I haven't updated any of the last ones either. And also, when looking at the video analytics, it's also the most skipped section of my videos. So while I know that a fair portion of you may be disappointed by the lack of charts for now, most of y'all were skipping out on it anyways, and that doesn't really motivate me to make sure I get them done. Also, last week I tried to encourage y'all to get Ben 10 trending on Twitter, and it worked. It also lined up with some of the anniversaries of the reboot specials, so that certainly helped. But I was was able to read countless tweets of people saying what they liked about the UAF and then the classic era and it's just really great to see community interaction especially when I go out purposefully looking for it but I have to express my disappointment that Ben didn't say hero time in this special Ben only said his signature catchphrase six times out of the 52 episodes of UA and the last time he did was in the episode where Charmcaster kills him it's smart to make sure he doesn't say the catchphrase enough to where it sounds too repetitive but you gotta throw me a bone here every now and then. The blue skull man needs his data bio. Also during the flashback sequence in this episode, they use clips from some of the episodes with the gradients removed, but it's interesting to see some clearer shots of early alien force before they figured out that not everything needs to be a black void. I was also looking through the wiki trying to find something for the next Omniverse breakdown. It also turns out that this finale leaked a few months before it aired in the US, and I vaguely remember feeling like parts of it was spoiled. I know they showed Ultimate way big in the commercial, so that surprise was gone right out the gate. But yeah, even without the promos, it looks like there was a chance people could have had this ruined for them anyways. I also did make my own flashback memories edit. I actually made two versions. One is very simple and character rooted. It's exactly what I was trying to make, where I really wanted to highlight all the characters and people Ben's met along the way, and that's what he should be thinking about when making his ultimate choice. That version's on the rust bucket, but it's actually the second version I made. The first time I kind of overdid it. I even had to end up extending the music, but if you're curious about seeing that version, you can see it on our Patreon, but I do think the second version, which is the public version, flows much better. But hey, if you're curious, it's only a dollar a month. From last week's poll, it seems like folks are very excited for me to talk about the malware arc. It seemed like Omniverse's most well thought out, planned, and interconnected story, so I can see why everyone's most excited for that. I'm also excited to break down the 200th episode special, the one with all the alternate bends and stuff, but that's not really an arc, so I didn't include it on the poll. For this poll, I want to ask y'all, do you like the Omniverse Omnitrix? This time I will We'll throw in a neutral answer. Sometimes I love the straightforward yes or no type of decisions, but this one I feel like you can have a little gray area with. But until then, I hope you enjoyed this UAF ride with me and have a fantastic rest of your weekend. And as always, keep it fizzy.